athletes take your mark get set it's time for the addict to athlete podcast everybody out there coach blue here i want to give everyone a special shout out and thanks for downloading subscribing and sharing this podcast we really are grateful to have uh, you guys share this with people that may be struggling with any kind of addiction um, we found that our erase and replace philosophy it holds true to no matter what uh, addictions you might be battling and, and even for the folks that want to support or know or love someone that's battling addiction Athletes, uh, I want to turn your attention to our website, addict2athlete.org, for lots of content, lots of um, amazing stuff to help get some answers to questions you might have. And it is because of that process, I am excited to have uh, a guy that that Marissa, the athletic director, found, believe it or not, on TikTok. And after doing a deep dive on Dr. B here, I'm excited to have him here because he is uh, a titan in the industry, I'll say. Uh, Dr. B is the founder, director, CEO, and medical, medical director of the American Addiction Institute, and that's a nonprofit IOP program for substance use and mental health. And so, Dr. B, before we jump into this, thank you so much for coming. Like I said, it's an honor to speak to you. Uh, I know you're incredibly busy and, and under the weather, so thanks for carving out a little bit of time. But would you mind introducing yourself to the, the listeners uh, a little bit about you? I'd love to know a little bit about why you moved from emergency ER medicine into the world of addiction recovery, because I think that's that's, that's quite a leap. You must have seen some amazing things to make that transition. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. And I'm sorry I'm a little under the weather and I was late today. And uh, again, thank you so much for having me. Um, sure. I think that's a good place to uh, start. I'll give you a little background. <clears throat> Historically, uh, uh, I'm not a businessman or have anything of my own. I've always been... Uh, in uh, academic medicine, right? Mm. So my background is academic medicine, in particular, emergency medicine. And with that comes trauma, critical care, pediatrics, toxicology, a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, I trained and was eventually recruited uh, uh, at a UCLA offsite, UCLA Kern, and then eventually UC Irvine. But uh, in that capacity, uh, that was a wonderful job. I loved it, both the training and uh, we were really well respected in our small world of academic emergency medicine. Uh, I remember a guy from USC who are like the kings of this said, hey, you have two choices. You can either train in emergency medicine during the war in Lebanon in 1982 mm. or you go to Kern and train with those guys. And I was right. those guys at one point. Um, uh, that's a county facility, actually, and uh, I love that uh, kind of spectrum of patients. You get great pathology, and you can uh, really uh, do a lot of service for a marginalized set of population. Kern County is one of the poorest, least educated counties in California, and uh, a few years running, it was uh, it made the list as the least educated city, Bakersfield, in America. Oh man, uh, it's it's a it's a real uh, uh, show there. Uh, mm. In that capacity, uh, I've always had a very very keen interest on serving marginalized populations, and I've had a particular interest in in our field. It's toxicology, which falls into overdoses, heroin, substance abuse, all that stuff, which is right under the flagship of emergency medicine, and we were. Yeah. Uh, uh, two things I started to notice was, uh, <clears throat> one, uh, addicts, heroin addicts, when they came in, and let's say I remember one case in particular, and I talk about this on an interview with uh, Andrew uh, something at the web, uh, YouTube channels, LAHWF. Right. Uh, does a two hour interview with me and I described some of this. One of the things I keenly remember is a guy had come in and he was muscling it in his uh, left shoulder. Mm -hmm. I still have pictures of this for teaching. And he had come in and he had had uh, what's called the necrotizing fasciitis, which means uh, everything just gets eaten away. And mm. they had done a skin graft and he was so underdosed with pain medication, he had just bounced. Now oh. he had come in and his left shoulder was black falling off down to the bone and uh, wow. I was to readmit him to the surgical service. And uh, they're sitting here trying to put this guy on two milligrams of morphine an hour. And I'm going, this guy's a heroin addict. 
On top of that, a normal person would need at least four milligrams an hour to deal with this. And that really struck me. Yeah. And, you know, we were sort of uh, uh, the kings of uh, overdoses. You know, someone overdoses and they come back and we do the Narcan and reverse them. Out yeah. in the field, what happens is, uh, and the paramedics were great. Out in the field, what happens is you immediately get two milligrams of Narcan because they want to give this huge dose to get you breathing again. And there's a lot right. of logistics. They just go. What mm -hmm. happens with that huge dose is you go into precipitated withdrawals the minute you wake up. Right? Like instantly, right? Like right, right. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's painful. Now, they would get to the ER uh, and uh, they are in bad shape from the precipitated withdrawals. They couldn't care less about the overdose. And I didn't like sort of the attitude towards that of uh, whoever. And these are not these are great people, but again, it's uh, they've been kind of uh, uh, shaded by uh, experience and being in the trenches and dealing with this stuff. But the attitude, you know, you don't have that attitude towards a diabetic in a situation or someone yeah. with heart failure. Well, this guy's gone, you know, and the attitude, I wasn't, so, you know, one of the things I would do when you could still do that is give the guy 10 milligrams of morphine and then watch him for one to two days. A lot of these issues, and then when I made the lateral transition to the university in Orange County, mm -hmm. I realized that, you know, uh, my whole life, I've uh, really not been a corporate guy. And even academic medicine is turning into corporate medicine. Mm -hmm. and it's sort of hardcore clinical position that I've always sought after in academic medicine was sort of disappearing. And that's another discussion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was becoming better and better at uh, managing uh, uh, mainly the heroin addicts. These guys, I was buddies with them all. They'd come in. I trained their bellies uh, from the, uh, the sea, uh, you know, uh, give them a little bit of a shot here to get them going. And I just one day uh, realized that I didn't want to do this academic medicine thing anymore, even though it was good money, good price, right. good pay. I enjoy the research. I enjoy my colleagues, but it just wasn't going to do it for me. And, I, and then I also noticed how well, I thought that care for substance abuse within all the private facilities in Orange County were just way off the mark. There was right. no science and there was no compassion. And then number two, the insurance mix up because there's so much money involved. Right. The insurance people trying to make as little days as possible. You have these guys. To, and I looked at the whole thing and worked for a couple of places. And I, to, for me at that time, just the, this is only four years ago. I was like, this mm -hmm. is cool. And this is bombastic. These people need what we call evidence-based scientific care, professionalism and compassion and in my mind, I was like, I can do this better than all of them. And none of them know what the concept of harm reduction is. And that's how oh. I that insane leap. And I'm still surviving. Well, when you, when you take that, that to, I guess, that path to say, hey, four years ago, I mean, that's, that's still fairly recent. I'm sure you were probably getting the side eyes and kind of like the, what do you think you're doing? This is the way it's always been done. But you're like, no, there's, there's got to be a more excellent way to do this. And I'm, I'm seeing things that aren't working. I love the fact that you're identifying the same things that we've seen in the treatment world where it's, uh, you know, almost, it was almost like pulling teeth trying to get like, qualified medical personnel to come in and to not just listen to the addict, but to know the addiction. Um, and, and I think what you're doing is, is amazing because you're, you're not taking it as a blanket covering of everything and one, one size fits all you're opening into your, the horizons to many modalities of like MAT of, of, of the, the individual person seeking recovery in and of itself. Did you get some pushback when you first started kind of detaching yourself and, and started creating a different mentality? I mean, harm reduction four years ago, they would have ran you out. I can only imagine because it was abstinence or nothing. And if it was a medicated thing, it was, you know, it was very monitored. It was a rapid detox and to get them off and taper them down real quick and then get them back out. Um, have you noticed the change in over the years from rapid tapering for people that really need MAT to like long term? Because I still think there's a big stigma around that. I think people, I still see treatment centers that I've worked for and, and since left that have said, no, they're, they're in here. We're going to get them on Suboxone. We're going to taper them down as fast as we can. Then we're going to get them moving because that's what we know should work. But it yeah. doesn't, does it? 
No, it doesn't. So as far as the pushback, not only did I get it then, uh, it's still there. And it's even there from the patient's perspectives. So it's a lot of them that have been, you know, I look at the insurance cards as a, a gold uh, master card because uh, uh, it becomes a lifestyle for some of these guys to go treatment hopping. Uh, mm-hmm. And it becomes a cultural expression ver- versus a treatment expression. Spot on. Uh, you know, and that's how I describe it. I can go to Costa Mesa and sit in a coffee shop and pick each one of the kids in rehab, right? Uh, it's, a, you know, the way they wear their hats. They all go to the same gym. They're yep. just popping. And uh, to the extent, th- there's been some movement, but to the extent a lot of these guys play ball, uh, it's simply because some of the insurance companies are like, look, what you're doing isn't working, so they pretend. So that stigma is there. The lack of knowledge and understanding is still there. Mm-hmm. And it's all around, whether it's the uh, physicians, the patients, the treatment providers, and society at large, including the parents. And when I went to do this, let me tell you, mm. I, I, I have no interest in being a businessman. I, I don't want to starve and die. Here, here. Mm-hmm. My interest is a paradigm shift, and I'll start with one person at a time. Yes. I want uh, nothing less than a paradigm shift. If, one, if I want to be a businessman or make money, I, I, I can. Uh, and I, let me tell you, it's been a struggle. And if I knew anything about business, I'd be mm. a very rich man even by now because we do good work. I treat guys as an outpatient through the office that, and uh, you can uh, validate this uh, by talking to some of them or coming in that have been to 30 treatment centers at a cost of over a million dollars. I have many guys like this, right? Uh, It's uh, and nothing I do is genius. This is the great thing. Yeah. uh, I take uh, credit for being a progressive innovator. And sometimes some of the guys that really know say, hey, Dr. B, you know, they don't get that. Nothing you're doing is, uh, is groundbreaking. You want to know what I do? I uh, it's a, yeah. you know, This disease is a chronic disease model, which you can get the best response approaching it that way. Your doctor should be the same doctor. You shouldn't have 50 different guys writing different medication. Because the same guy is going to get to know you over time, understand your your physiology, your mental health, your social issues, your uh, legal issues, and uh, really uh, uh, work with you over time to get this thing under control. I mean, Mm. I go on and on about each one of these topics. Yeah. Because there, the resistance is still there. Some people pretend it's not. And the lack of education from the provider side, for example, yes. I am extremely good at micromanaging my Suboxone dose to deal with sleep, anxiety, depression, beyond withdrawals, and the science backs me up. Uh, uh, very few people take the time to do that or get to know that medication. Yes. Uh, I hope that answers some of the Well, it, it does. And what you just said there, I think kind of like sums it up for me too, Dr. B. And that's, that's the time. Who really invests the time? Because, you know, it's interesting. I, I love hearing what you're saying because it's what we do on Team Addict to Athlete. It's a free community resource, much like what a 12-step would be, only we, we're not 12-step at all. We, we're very not much not anonymous and we're very much, you know, in the public eye. And we do things to help people understand that once an addict, always an addict isn't true. And the interesting thing I've noticed is that we have people that have been around since we started year one. That was 10 years ago. And it's about the time. I, do you see that being a problem even in today's treatment world where it's all about getting that next bed filled? And so it's a rapid process instead of the time that it takes because, yeah, the money's not there for it. But that's a real person that's sitting on the other side of that of that office, right? Yeah, and you nailed it. And uh, so the, you nailed one area of it. How about so that time, we go back to the concept of chronic disease, uh, where uh, you need to invest and they need to invest over a long period. What's interesting is uh, everybody loses when you do the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am treatment. The patient loses, the insurance company loses, and society and families lose because you need to, I spend, the when a patient comes in, I tell them, uh, listen, 
I am not a prescription monkey. I'm a physician and a clinician, okay? Mm -hmm. Giving you that prescription, as important as it is for me, because that's what I know uh, from my training, uh, that is one piece of my arsenal. Get that straight. Otherwise, we don't have a relationship. Now mm -hmm. let's start building on, uh, uh, let's take that and build on our it. Here's a problem with what it is, is that there's no payment for this long-term care. You know, it's really, right. really, you know, we get paid oftentimes at pennies on the dollar and, uh, and uh, it's tough. Uh, and we're trying to work that out where, you know, hopefully some of these guys with real insurances, you know, get more attracted to us and understand that this is not about what they want and they shouldn't be dictating their care. If they want to get better, let's do this over the long term. Some of my patients, I mean, again, I think it'd be really cool. Yeah. You know, some of these guys I've been taking care of two years, three years, four years, and I wow. always going through my system. I'm like, hey, you see that kid you just spoke to? I'm like, yeah. They're like, yeah. I'm like, two years ago, you wouldn't recognize him. He was abscessed out from head to toe and mm. hopeless. And they're like, you're kidding me, him? I'm like, yeah. And he had been to about seven treatment centers. <laughs> and uh, that is what my private practice looks like of guys that are basically, they come in. That in best case scenario, they come in once a month or once every two months and just get their medication. And they know there's no need to lie about anything. And as soon as things start going south, they just talk to me and we get it back on. That's mm -hmm. chronic disease at its most wonderful end stage uh, 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 sort of tailored care where they get to a point where it's just touch and go, get your medication. And so, yes, uh, I agree <laughs> when the payments aren't there up front. I mean, we could, uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe some of these guys. I mean, the, everybody's like, you should be dead. You should be dead. You should be dead. And yeah. they're not even recognizable. <laughs> you know, to, to me, that that is absolutely, to me, it's magic. And, and I think that, uh, that with some of the turns of the tide that I, I, I like seeing is, is the, the more accessibility of MAT. And this was a big thing. I remember I worked for a government program for many years and, and it was the same thing. I, I remember the switch from like complete abstinence to MAT and then trying to change people's perspectives. I remember some of my clients would come in and say, well, my, my, my 12 step meeting is upset with me because I'm taking this and we had to, you know, untwine all that garbage. But the thing that's interesting now is that um, there still seems to be that little bit of a delay in like, it's going to work. I've seen so many folks that I've worked with personally that have like wanted to quit cold turkey, but needed MAT, but didn't want it yet. They would go out and grab you know, whatever substance. What do you think that that disconnect from, you know, something that's that's prescribed that can be taken as you as you give them, you know, to like help lessen the the you know the triggers, the the cravings, all that stuff versus them trying to go cold turkey? What are the people that are on the fence? What do they need to know about why MAT is so important and and that it does work if you follow your doctor's direction? Yeah, some of the common things I uh, you know. Uh, again, this comes from an old paradigm, much of it 12 step, uh, mm -hmm. much, some of it, I'll tell you, uh, quite a bit of it goes back, uh, to the Harrison drug act of 1914 mm -hmm. and the first, uh, before DEA, not uh, the department of, uh, narcotics, I think it was mm -hmm. 1930, what they did to stigmatize addicts and addiction, the addict until they feel, uh, um, I, I'm going to say safe uh, and uh, loved and not judged until they feel that about these medications, which means we have to reorient everybody and educate them. Right. MAT is not addiction. It doesn't even fit the definition. Okay. I we love all it. have to get over that. Uh, so this constant trying People have to get used. There has to. Uh, we have this in many areas of our society today, but it's a you know it's a cognitive dissonance from reality. Yeah. Uh, look, you have a disease, and uh, and again, please take that with a grain of salt. We're going to use the disease model to the mm. extent. Yeah, that's another thing I want to say. I want to touch you, base on that. I have a, I have a few questions about that. So thank you. Yeah, continue. Yeah. Uh, when I say. Uh, let's use the chronic disease model. This is not uh, what in a philosophy they call an ontological status. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that, it's not is, 
you do not have a disease and that can be, yeah, the, Joe, look at it this way. It's a model that describes the situation and I get results using that model and I can predict outcomes using that model. Mm -hmm. Besides that, you're Joe and you're not an addict. Yeah. You're Joe that has a problem just like uh, uh, someone has uh, diabetes, just like mm -hmm. someone has heart failure, but it doesn't mean anything and it shouldn't define you. Mm -hmm. And using this medication doesn't make you an addict substituting one thing from another because yeah. the definition they use when they do that is wrong. Let's yes. get you to a place where we can deal first with the physical, then with the complexity of this disease at the physiological or pathophysiological level, then let's move on to the mental health. Then let's move on how we can place you back into this complex social network and milieu, which in my opinion, promotes the disease and have it so you can have the best life possible as Joe. And I wow. really want to be clear about that. I yes. am a physician, so I can use this model. I've done my studies. It works. And then from there, we move on. This is a very complex situation that I can define in psychological, social, psychosocial, and political terms and say it's a disease of our society. So mm -hmm. I just want to be, be clear on that. I use that model to the extent I need to to get you well. Then let's move on, Joe. Your name is Joe, and you have this issue like I use a cane. Dr. B, I, I love that so much. You are, you, you've literally just answered so many questions. The thing that I've tried to help my clients with too, is to understand that the disease model works to a point, but, but that's the thing. I think I'm, I'm curious, what is your, what is your genuine thought on, on classifying it all just as a disease? Because I, I think I heard you correctly. It, it works to a certain point, but if we classify all this as a disease, then doesn't that kind of mean to the person who's going through it, that there's no end? Right. Uh, that's a great thing. I, have a, I mean, I have a really big question for you. I know you want to answer that one, but I was thinking, I, I teach, and I can only do this from personal experience, you know, 25 years clean and all that stuff, you know, race and replace. But I, I'm a firm believer that when the right principles are applied, when the right people have intervened and assisted, you know, medical, you know, mental, all that stuff, that you don't have to continually for the rest of your life be in recovery, but you can heal from this. What do you think of that? Healing versus recovery. I'm curious. This, it's, it's such a great question with so many uh, new yeah. and we can talk about just I would I would love to know because I'll be honest with you doc I want to know because I I do talk a lot about the healing of addiction and not being in recovery I, I kind of tell my clients from now and then I'm like if you break a bone in your backyard or you're playing football in high school and you, you can't play football anymore but then years later you're married and you have your kid and your kid wants to go out in the backyard and throw the ball to you but you're like, like sorry kid I can't I'm, I'm still in recovery from a broken arm I think that when the right things applied and when the right interventions are, are met, that you can heal from this. And I'd love to know your thoughts on this, Doc. Yeah, that's it. So I have to be really uh, careful when I talk I know. about the chronic disease and I want everyone to understand. <clears throat> I don't mean it in the 12 step way. I'm an addict for life or having mm -hmm. 30 years. I do not mean it in that way. Thank you. It's a chronic disease but I mean it initially and for as long as I need to, and when I need to, when there is use, okay? And then uh, from that point, we can move. And I, uh, I go, I jump from model to model because mm. now I ask, well, what are the underlying psychological issues that cause disease? Because I truly believe that and the science kind of tells me that's the case. Right. And I move to that. And then from there, <clears throat> to the extent that I can, this is also a social disease because there's a lot of malignancy within our social, political economy and structure. And then I try to get you back into a society because I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. A kid, and I can say his name because he's uh, all over the papers. They did a thing a few years ago in Orange County. His name uh, uh, is uh, Brody Webster. And uh, one day I was sitting there with Brody. Brody had been to 35 detoxes, and it took me three or four times to get him in. Uh, 21 years old, methamphetamines, benzos, heroin, marijuana. 
and he kept taking an Uber to come to me and uh, kept, uh, not making it there because he was in psychosis. Well, three years later, I just got off the phone with him. Uh, he's up in Seattle and uh, we, wow. and he's in the paper, so I can say his name. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's doing amazing, finally moved back home and he's not even the same person. And I remember sitting there one day, okay, what am I supposed to tell Brody once I get to where I need to? Go back to your shitty environment yeah. and uh, get a crappy job at 7-Eleven and deal with all the crap throughout your childhood that you dealt with before and that ended you up in the same place. I can't say that to this. Mm -mm. I have to give him the tools to go back into society, which I don't think is optimal, and cope and have a stress response that understands why he got to this place in the first place and deal with it so he can have as healthy a life as possible. And so I've moved from the physiological now to the psychological and social. Mm. And, uh, and uh, it is not an issue of you have this disease and that, that's it for life. We all suffer from the disease of addiction. And what do I mean by that? There is an emptiness and a need in every one of us for meaning, for a sense of self-worth, for our ego, the, the psychoanalytic ego, to be worth something, for yeah. connectedness with human beings. And many, many of these guys are missing that. Find meaning in yourself, not what society, your peers, or everyone else wants you to be. If I can get them to that, I will have gotten to the root of addiction. And we're no longer talking about you have this chronic disease addiction. And uh, no, we're talking about the pathophysiology and malignancy of a social order that's gone down the tubes. Yeah. Financial, economic, relationships, jobs, future. And so uh, I hope that makes sense. I'm trying it to does. Get all into a couple <clears throat> of seconds. I want these guys to find meaning eventually in who they are. And, they, you know, this explains their anxiety, their <clears throat> depression, their the complex uh, post-traumatic stuff. And again, I'm just a physician and uh, I'm stepping outside of my field as I uh, discuss these things. But I know for a fact that the data is clear and I have to work to create a better society for everybody. And I can start with these guys who need it the most. And hopefully it spreads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I like that. And, and for the longest time, you know, the last several years, as you know, in the industry, when they started to, to bring addiction into the mental health world and, and try and combine the two. Um, what are your thoughts on doing that? Should, is it a good thing that we've combined the two? Should we have always kind of kept them separate the way we treat things? Because at first, I, I thought, well, this is going to be really hard. But then I started noticing that there's benefits when when therapists speak with doctors and doctors and therapists and, and psychologists and, and the team gets bigger. But I've also noticed in, in places I've worked at that have not been so hot, um, there's always us versus them. And I think that's the dumbest pissing match to get involved in because it ends up hurting the client. Do you think that, that uh, bringing those two things together was beneficial when they started to do that? Because then, of course... On my side, we used to own a treatment center and, and got out of that industry because it was very not good for what we were seeing. And we left. We, we started our own thing. Um, what I noticed is that we would have to, as a therapist, we'd have to overemphasize issues because it didn't fit the medical model anymore. So I think, and I don't know how you feel about this, but like, it seems to me like the traditional treatment mentality, treatment model that we have now, that seems to be a dinosaur. And I think it's probably going the way of the tar pits. I don't think it's going to be around anymore because of what I've noticed in the industry itself. Do you see this going more medical long-term than it is traditional residential treatment centers, you know, doing all the education and all the, the, the therapy and then the aftercare, so, you know, sober living, or do you see it being more turned into like a, the medical model itself where detox and then outpatient and so on. So I'm curious what you're, what you're seeing on the horizon. Uh, I am, uh, well, on a positive thing, I am seeing more uh, uh, push towards uh, um, uh, in a way, the fact that this is a medical model, clinical thing. So right. that's sort of positive. Nevertheless, I still expect it to go wrong. 
because we are a reactionary society based on uh, uh, financial results, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, turning it into one of the problems with purely taking it, turning it into a medical uh, model based on medication-assisted treatment is that is a reductionist view of disease. That means I take the manifestation of the disease, let's say in this case drugs, and then forget how it got there, or why it got there, if it's anything more complex than a series of events that I can point out to with an x-ray or lab result or outcome. Uh, So uh, 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 having said that, that it's positive, uh, hopefully it doesn't throw out the mental health and the mental health, uh, like what I've done in my program, and it took me forever to get uh, someone like this. I have Dr. G, who's a clinical psychologist, we work hand in hand. Beautiful. Both under, you know, he, uh, I do my best, even though, again, we're having logistical issues as we grow. We, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we, we both understand that initially uh, I have a really good uh, keen sense eye on how to manage these people playing with my medication. Uh, he starts on his therapy immediately. He understands the psychological as well as the greater social influences, including family, jobs, and greater society. So we're both on the same page and uh, our challenge is to get this thing going and uh, be able to serve all the people coming in and train others because we really see it uh, in terms of harm reduction, greater model. So ideally the doctor should not be in uh, any kind of uh, dissonance with the mental health team, with the case managers, with the social workers. Everybody should be on the same page because everything is a trigger and a stress for that person to fail. And we should all work together and communicate. We're trying to get there. I admit we're a little bit failing just because of logistics and we're trying to get everything happening. We need more yeah. people. We need more money uh, to grow and do it that way. But our uh, dream is to have this sort of holistic uh, team uh, one thing that's amazing about our team is everybody really cares. Okay? Yes. Now it comes to getting everybody trained and communicate and uh, document things like that. But, uh, you know, so that's my view is that hopefully, well, I, uh, I, I think the medical model will take hold more and more, but that has its negatives because we take things to a silly extreme mm. and we cannot forget, you know, you give these people meaning, jobs, uh, yep. comfort, loved ones, get them out of the prison industrial complex. Uh, they're going to do well and flourish. Yep. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think uh, the whole model needs to be there. There needs to be very active communication with all team members. Uh, and uh, and uh, these people can get there. I, I love that. And that's the marriage and the union. I think that would, that would definitely change the whole perspective on how to help someone, you know, move from A to B. I mean, that's, that, that would be, that would be the ultimate. And I love, I love your vision. So with, with team addict to athlete, you know, it, it's a, it's a free community group and we help people erase addiction by replacing it with things of greater value, not just, you know, health and wellness and recreation. We do service and, and relationship building and all kinds of other things. And I've noticed that being plugged in has been good. But because we were working with the adult addicts, our meetings are completely different than anything else. You know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of smoking and coffee drinking because after our, our meeting, we go out and run or go out and work out or go play ball or something, hiking. We noticed there's a lot of younger kids that started to come, you know, the kids of the people that are struggling with addiction. And some of them came with their addictions their own. Um, peeling back the layer on some of the youth treatment out there, I'm curious because mostly what happens when kids get into addictions and whatnot younger, it seems that they kind of move towards like, like, uh, like medications for, for moods and, and depressions and things of that nature. Um, I had a question not too long ago by a client who asked me specifically, you know, her son's been drinking, would abuse be a good thing for him? And I thought, I don't know much about that. And so I had her go talk to her physician, but it did raise a question with me. Um, how prone are we to open up some of these doors for younger people? Has it been explored? What is, what is the, I mean, I, I would imagine there'd be maybe some differences, obviously. Uh <clears throat> 
in terms of treatment? Yeah, treatment and even even to a certain degree, if needs be, medicated assisted therapy. There's there's been like 16, 17, 18 year olds that I've worked with in the past that have had severe addictions. Um, and it's never really been brought up and I've never even thought about it until speaking with you. And um, I'm sure the research probably, I don't know if it's out there or not, but like, is this something that you want to shy away from and do more psycho ed and psycho you know, therapy before you try that? No, no. I'm, uh, in fact, uh, what, they actually suffer more than most because their hands are tied and they often get caught up in the system and what adults do. And in fact, everything I said applies to them even more. You have an opportunity to catch them before they fall super hard. Now, uh, but getting to them uh, has more liability and you need more resources. Okay? Right. Uh, I, am a, I run a, a different program, which, which we just started. It's called Project Sanctuary. We mm. took off the name of Sober Living Home and we call it Evidence-Based Reentry Housing, right? Beautiful. And, mm-hmm. and, and because, uh, you know, in terms of how, and we deal with a lot of parolees, ex-cons, stuff like that. Right. But it's the same thing. Uh, these people need, and the youth, they need resources. They need good mental health. They need love. They need to be empowered and have a sense of meaning in who they are. And most importantly, I'm a big fan of education because education empowers and gives you true choice instead of living in La La Land and a mystery. So these kids need it most. And in fact, you brought something up about, um, I'm going to curb another concept. Uh, When I uh, I use the term medication-assisted treatment, I'm strictly the discussing uh, medication for opiates. Now you brought up the issue of psychotropics. Uh, uh, One, again, another problem. I have noticed, uh, as far as I'm concerned, most people are over-medicated on the wrong medication. Remember, I'm a big fan of medicines because I'm a doctor, right? Right. But Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, uh, 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 eight out of 10 people on the medication they're on probably shouldn't be on it or they're at too high of a dose. Yeah, medication assisted treatment. These kids are being medicated and getting introduced to a concept that I'm absolutely against. I'm a doctor, not a prescription monkey. They yes, all everything else. Yes, I have people on medications. Yeah, but uh, and this was another area that sort of developed my practice. And it uh, some things are happening now. I have people that come to me for what would be called polypharmacy. I'll give you one example. There's hmm. one, two of them. A lady in her uh, now 60s came to me about three years ago when I started all of this, four years ago. She was on 17 different medications, psychotropics, um. dilated, benzos. She had the label of uh, bipolar. Uh, I mean, it was endless. And I'm like, this is insane. Yeah. What I do is I spent uh, as long as I need to and uh, make my choices and do it a certain way, get them off of everything, and you see a human being. So huh? four years later, she's on one medication and uh, you wouldn't even recognize her. And I have quite a few of these guys. So those <laughs> kids are falling into the same situation. Hey, kid, your problem is not for me to give you 500 of Seroquel a day. You're 15 years old. Yeah. Get to the root of the issue. Uh, Gang banging is not where you need to be at. Let me tell you why. Uh, let me get you to trust me and my team. We're not going to let you down. We're not going to enable you. Mm-hmm. We will empower you. We are going to hold you accountable and responsible. We're not going to judge you. Okay? And yeah. it starts to sink in. So that group needs it even more than the adult group. And uh, parents need to be educated. Families need to be educated. Uh, look, as far as I'm concerned, the whole society needs to be educated about yeah. uh, what we need to do. Yeah, think about it. You know, people, uh, I hate it when I get comments and I, I'll, I'll stop real after this. Uh, I'm a drug You're fine. And I'm uh-huh. like, dude, you don't know. This is uh, uh, the most uh, insulting thing you could say to me. I, uh, I, I speak out against pharmaceuticals all the time. When I was working as a attending professor, I wouldn't even let the pharmaceuticals come and buy breakfast for my residents. I would say, you guys will get enough. I, I was hated for that. And even now, 
you know, I will simply say, think about what a pharmaceutical is. We live in a society where it's purely based on flow of capital. So if you're a pharmaceutical company and you make a drug and uh, your livelihood depends on it, there's nothing else for you to do but push that drug on as many people as possible for right. as long as possible. How could that be a good positive thing? It's just the nature of that economic exchange. And then we have insurance companies. Well, you're going to try and pay as little as possible for as shortest time as possible. How is that oh. work in a social thing like health? Yeah, you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't work at all. And, and that's, that's the competing thing. And, and that's, you know, you know, phase two of that question then too comes when, you know, here in Utah, we are, we've just barely passed the, the medical cannabis act to where people can get THC for, you know, for medical purposes. Um, and uh, I, I was kind of poking around in, in uh, an outpatient program and uh, there was a doctor there that was prescribing it. And when the girl received her, her prescription, man, she used, started cheering like as if she just watched a touchdown of a football game she was rooting for. I got thinking, okay, we got to be super careful with this too, because I'm curious, you know, as, as I kind of am teaching some of my clients and stuff, that now that THC could be available for that in Utah, very first year they've ever done this, that doesn't mean that if you're in recovery, you should run out there and get it. Because I've noticed now several of my, my athletes and my clients have slipped back into active addiction because they thought, well, now it's now I can use it. Well, I'm I'm so curious of your your take on this. Should people in re, in addictions be now substituting going back on that for absolutely. the purpose of depression? Uh, wow, well, you open another can of absolutely not. Look, Thank I am you. from the Bay Area, Berkeley, San Francisco. Traditionally, yeah. I couldn't care less if uh, uh, my own uh, kid was smoking a joint at one point, and then I started to realize. Uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, and it took me a minute. Then I would listen to American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, pound on marijuana, and I would listen to their lectures. I'm like, these guys are just saying that. They're a bunch of doctors in white uh, coats and uh, white collar folks. There's no science against uh, marijuana. Then I start, and, and I do believe they were wrong and they were just saying it, and I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, and then I started to notice something. Everybody in my program, there uh, that were you know I couldn't get them to smoke pot. They were abusing it, yeah. and they would not move forward in their recovery. This stuff, something's off. Then I'm like, wow, Farid, you're an idiot. Uh, <laughs> this ain't the same pot as before. We don't know anything about this stuff. How powerful it is, the way people are taking it in. Then. I uh, listened to a lecture from a uh, colleague at UCSF, and boy, people are going in for psychosis, anxiety, rehab, uh, bad uh, side effects. And then I noticed I really put my foot down on the marijuana. Anybody who did uh, uh, put that stuff away, their recovery went like this. It is an app, same thing. I don't care, marijuana yeah. or, uh, or a pill. That stuff is uh, prone to the market forces as well. They're going to push it on everybody. And yeah. we don't know enough about it. Absolutely. You nailed it. And I think it's irresponsible to prescribe that. In fact, uh, if you are in my IOP or sober living home, you cannot smoke pot. I let the guys in my outpatient get away with it. Mm -hmm. And I work little by little. I mean, you know, they're like, yeah, I continue to have anxiety. Hey, Joe, listen, I'm telling you. Get rid of the pot, the anxiety. There's not one person who followed that direction and things did not resolve <laughs> anxiety or, uh, or getting on with their life. So I agree. You nailed it. Thank you. Well, because I was, I was wondering, and I'll tell you, because as I raised my hand of, of concern, it was you know given to me back from, from the owner of the program that, well, this is harm reduction. And I'm like, I don't think this classifies as harm reduction. I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense. I mean, how could it be when now we're seeing that it's not just testing THC, but now it's testing alcohol and now it's testing you know, heroin, opiates again. How is this harm reduction? So they shouldn't really use that as an umbrella of like, you know, yeah, we can give this to them because at least they're not shooting heroin now. I'm like, well, it's not the same thing. Yeah, right? Exactly. Here's what your response can be. People keep talking about uh, 
Suboxone replacing one drug for another wrong. It doesn't uh, fit the criteria of the addiction. But now they're talking about smoking pot as harm reduction. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's replacing one drug for another that will affect Thank you the way it is now with this cohort of patients, not regular human beings that uh, don't have addiction as a issue, but uh, this group of human beings, it will probably lead back into heroin. So it's not harm reduction. You're a uh, short time replacing one thing for another that's going to escalate and snowball. And there's no science for you to, by the way, harm reduction is well embedded in scientific literature and results. When I talk about harm reduction uh, and a methadone clinic, by the way, I also run a methadone clinic. Uh, mm. When I talk about harm reduction, needle exchange, I'm not saying that, hey, let's just be sweet to people and everyone deserves to uh, be nice to. I'm saying, no, this stuff, we got 50 years of data that shows that this is the way to go. So right. that's the other thing. When they're saying harm reduction, where's your data? And what do you think harm reduction means? Right. Yeah. And that's the thing too, right? Is, and I'll be honest with you, Dr. B, when I'm driving around and I see the old, uh, the old yard political signs you know, stuck in the ground that actually say, hey, you need your medical marijuana card, call this. I think that's a weird way to advertise a medication, right? I mean, you wouldn't say, hey, if you need opiates, come here. Um, it's just curious why people don't realize that. And maybe it's just because it's so new here, but I can see it being a, a, a very deep chasm if we don't get real educated on what it should be used for and if it should be used at all. So uh, I just think that's very weird marketing. It's like you said, there's, there's money coming in somewhere. So the same thing, I listened to your stuff on Kratom when you were talking to the, the gentleman from that society. And I loved everything you said, because for so many people, they're not seeing the other side that, that they see the people that are really struggling with this stuff. Cause as far as I'm concerned, Kratom, every time I've seen someone on that stuff, it's been a nightmare for these poor people. You know, same thing. We were told ages ago that when gabapentin first came out, it was non-addictive and we were told it was non-addictive. And so my clients would come back in and they'd have, oh, my roommate stole my, 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 my 90 day prescription of, of, uh, you know, of gabapentin. So the doctor would prescribe more and lo and behold, another week go by, he did it again. My, my roommate stole my, no, you did, you're using it all. So, I mean, we got to be cautious on this too. Like with the people in recovery, you have to know that if you truly want to get to that sober point in life, You've got to be honest with yourself, correct? I mean, it's it will help you get there, I mean, uh, but you got to do it. You you have an amazing insight because uh, most people don't uh, get this. Look, gabapentin, I've never prescribed it. And <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen my videos. If you come into my clinic or program on GABA, you will get tapered off and you will be <laughs> educated. Long uh, before... Uh, uh, I made a video like four years ago, I think. Uh, I'll find it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I got I'll find it somewhere. Uh, uh, and I said, look, gabapentin is a substance of abuse in the addiction community, period. And it'd be, they're like looking at, and I was in yeah. school for about a month. And uh, they're looking at me like I'm insane. You nailed it on Kratom. Does Kratom have a therapeutic benefit? It probably does from what I can tell. Not like this, right? And... Uh, you're catching all this stuff that is the bane of my existence. Yeah. And, and so if we could put it all into uh, uh, all the stuff you're saying, what is the issue here? And for me, the way I see it, I think the issue is our political economy and uh, infrastructure of how things work in this, uh, in our society and right. how people make their money. There's no conspiracy it's just the way we have things set up, right? Right. And so with that comes, let's not educate, let's miseducate. And uh, because, you know, TikTok is a wonderful platform as it turned out for me, uh, because yeah. working on people, but I can't educate you in a 30 second skill. No, absolutely. Yeah, well, that stuff that you did with, with, with the gentleman on the Kratom just recently, I listened to everything and it was awesome because <clears throat> I, I figured it out like, and you were great about saying, well, you're, you're, you're doing too much. And it's quick talkers. It's trying to dump as much information as possible so that we ourselves say, well, this person has so much knowledge on this. Maybe I'm wrong. And I love that you didn't 
go there with him. And I thought that was awesome because that happens so much. Either it's with, you know, a counselor and, a, and, a, and an addict, or it's a doctor and an addict, and they're trying to get them in and out. It's like, when you start dumping that much on people, they can do nothing but agree because obviously you're the professional. So I really appreciated the way that you slowed it down, even though he really wanted to move you. Yeah, and I was like, this is perfect. That. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, wow, you caught all of that too. What mm -hmm. happened is, you know, Max, I'm sure a great guy. He was yeah. uh, actually a policymaker, senior policymaker in the Reagan administration. When yeah. I went in there, I had no idea who he is. And he had sent me some things about his positions. I'm like, okay, great. I, my, the only thing I want to uh, uh, talk about is uh, Kratom. And he started to uh, uh, use these techniques, which I would watch on Fox News or something. Yeah. I'm not going to go there. No one's cutting. Me. I'm going to stop right there and say, uh, number one, the stuff you're saying is meaningless. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, you're, and so I made a really... Uh, it took me forever. I said, let's look at one autopsy and let's w see what it takes to read yep. the kind of comments you're making. Uh, yeah. I don't know if he was uh, mad at me at the end or whatever, but it was really important for me to do that for those that are listening and to see what critical and formal thinking is before you make a decision about anything. And you caught all yeah. of that. Oh, 100%, right? Dr. B, 100%. And, and because of such, because we've had, you know, so many of our athletes who are in active recovery, because like we say, our, our group is addict to athlete. It's just another modality to get to get health and, and, and get yourself on track and start moving. So I think in addiction recovery, you got to move. Um, I sent that to a lot of uh, the, the athletes that we, that we train and they're like, okay, I get it. And they all could, they all picked that up. Like it was awesome because so many of them used it, but they've had horrible issues with it. And it's like, it's the tolerance level goes up fast. And then when they, they, they quit, it's horrible. And so I'm like, I can understand how it could be for some people, but not this population. And I love the fact that you were saying, look, you're not even able to classify it. I think that happens so much with our people that we work with, especially newly in recovery. You know, they'll take anything if it can get them past that hard part. And I'm like, I love the fact that you didn't, you didn't allow that they did that the tsunami of, of like a, re, a recited, you know, like, like poem to overtake you and just to stop you in your tracks. I love the fact that you took it slow. And that's why one of the reasons why I was so excited to talk to you is because I know that when I ask you these questions, you'll give me a real answer. Oh, so important. I that. I'm, I'm actually uh, uh, humbled by the fact that you see what I'm doing. Uh, I always wonder if people are catching it because I'm trying to change and realign the way people think about things on the bigger thing. And you, you, you're nailing it. It's, uh, it's uh, kind of exciting. Uh, no, I, I do. I, I appreciate it. And, and uh, yeah, the hour's gone by super fast. But, yeah. uh, you know, I'd, I'd love that if this opportunity comes up again to, to chat with you again, because listeners, you've been well fed. Dr. B, how do people get in touch with you? My, my wife, Marissa, who you know, has a question for you. We'll do it off the air, but we can do it on the air. Marissa wants to know if you're up to the numbers you need on TikTok yet so that we get to know... Uh, your, your we just buddy. want to know what Jimmy looks we like. We got to know what Jimmy looks like. <laughs> yeah, all team addict athletes waiting. Uh, we are, uh, what are we at? Uh, we're at 85,000. It's supposed to be 100,000. And poor <laughs> Jimmy, he's getting really nervous. I love Is it. Is he good? Yeah, he's, uh, he's, like, he's like starting to run around and he's kind of uh, excited. People talk about him. And uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, how we're going to do this. Uh, Got to be something big now. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he's so neat. And you know what's funny? A few patients come from TikTok and they actually show up on a day when me and Jimmy have been shooting and they see Jimmy. And I'm <laughs> like, uh, hey, you guys can't say anything. But uh, Matt, That's awesome. I love it. So there, there's a plea right there, uh, all you athlete listeners. Um, yeah. Go jump on Dr. B's TikTok handle and uh, and follow, follow him, him so we can meet Jimmy. So can see who Jimmy yeah. is. Uh, we're, we're getting there, Marissa. Uh, we're, we're almost there. And uh, you guys will see him and we'll tell a little bit about him. The YouTube channel, that's a nonprofit endeavor. I'm trying to do more and more, uh, uh, you know, at least three times a week. One of mm -hmm. my shortcomings on that. It, it was strictly started for, and I'll end this right now, it was strictly started for patient education and uh, about 15 months ago, and it just went crazy. We're getting over 40,000 views a month now. I love it. Uh, yeah. The problem with it is, believe it or not, or maybe you can when you see it, I haven't ever prepared for one talk on there. Everything is off the cuff. I love it. 
uh, I told Jimmy and Austin, I'm like, look, I need to prepare and be more formal. We're getting a lot of viewers. So goal is to grow that. And it's strictly for uh, education of everybody. And I want to move to the greater social stuff and bring some people on. Maybe we'll bring you on at some point. Here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this was fantastic. You guys are amazing. I'm so uh, absolutely surprised. We've been well fed, and so listeners, listen to what Dr. B is talking about. Jump on the TikTok. We'll put links in in the uh, in the podcast to get in connection with all these guys. And until next time, athletes, go turn your mess into a message. <laughs>